So this is line 17 T2. Um, this is the data names that came up. Bata, B-O-T-D-A, fiber optics, Fournier, sinusoid, molecular vibration, superluminal, luminescent energy transport, wow, study, part 99. Again, this is based on the line 17 Wild wow, Study Alien Signal, 1977. The math equation is 14, 1, 1, 13, 2, and 1. If you're just joining us, you want to start at 17A. Okay? That's where this whole section starts, and I've divided into different parts. So this is based on some data I came up with January 21st, 2012. This is the pumping pulse light here. 2x2 two two coupler PD test fiber 0 to L and Z and there's some squiggy line here. CW probe light and optical fiber. This is a figure working principle of fiber optic Bata, Badka, Bada technology. It's a brand new technology that came up from this signal equation. So this is the data that came up right here. That's what it looks like. Okay, and this is uh, abstract from it. We propose a simple technique that is able to mitigate non-local effects in Brillouin optical time domain analysis or BATA sensors. The technique consists in pulsing the probe wave so that the Brillouin interaction only takes place in the portion of the fiber. A shorter interaction length reduces the non-local effects induced by pump depletion. The portion of fiber investigated each time can be easily scanned along the whole fiber length so that the complete Brillouin frequency shift distribution can be retrieved by successive measurements. And that's under ieexplore.ieee.org. Um, I will be posting the links and the data soon on the Victoria Stafford Psychic Investigation website. That's where I've been putting my notes and my, the links to my research, okay? So January 21st, the field of applying, applied science and engineering concerned with the design and application of optical fibers is known as fiber optics. Optical fibers are widely used in fiber optic communications. Uh, we use it in our cable TV, we use it in our phones, and we are now using it in our internet as well. And that's how they were able to give us the faster transfer speeds which permits transmission over longer distances and at higher bandwidths, data rates, than other forms of communication. Fibers are used instead of metal wires because signals travel along them with less loss and are also immune to electromagnetic interference. Fibers are also used for illumination and are wrapped in bundles so they can be used to carry images, thus allowing viewing in tight spaces. Specially designed fibers are used for a variety of other applications, including sensors and fiber lasers. And here's an optical fiber junction box. Okay, this is what um, fiber optics look like. And we'll go back to the box here. Light is kept in the core by total internal reflection. This causes the fiber to act as a waveguide. Fibers that support many propagation paths or transverse modes are called multimode fibers, MMF. MMF. Well, those that only support a single mold are called single mold fibers, SMF. Okay, so we'll pop back over here. Now, this is called an ultra short pulse of light in the time domain. And so this is elect electric field AU and then time TFS. This is electric field intensity, the red one, and electric field amplitude is the green, and the real electric field is the blue. Okay, so in this figure, the amplitude and intensity are Gaussian functions. The phase function is quadratic, quad, quadratic resulting in instant, instantaneous frequency sweep, sometimes called a chirp, in al analogy to the sound of some birds. That's a wiki under ultra short pulse. I looked up the short uh, pulse because I didn't know what kind of pulse they used for, with the neutrinos, and I was trying to figure it out. So intense, intense pulse light, IPL, is a technology aimed at producing light of high intensity during a very short period of time. It involves specific lamps together with capacitors whose rate of discharge provides the high energy required. That's in Wiki under intense pulse light. 
And then we've got superluminal energy transport according to a paper published in April 2011 in Optics Communications. The velocity of transfer energy of the transmitted electromagnetic field in the optical thinner medium can exceed the light speed of vacuum. However, this violates a variety of physical laws. Okay, and so an optical fiber or optical fiber is a flexible transparent fiber made of pure glass silica, not much wider than a human hair. It functions as a waveguide or light pop to transmit light between the two ends of the fiber. And there's some readings there. This is a normalized Gaussian curve with expected value U and variance. That's from the Gaussian function. I looked it up to see what it was. Okay, in mathematics, the Gaussian function named after Jonathan Carl Fried Gauss is a function of the form fx equals ae and then x minus b to the power of 2 divided by 2c to the power of 2. For some real constants, a, b, c are greater than 0 and e is equal to 2.7182.81828 Euler's number. The graph of a Gaussian is a characteristic characteristic symmetric bell curve shape that quickly falls off towards plus minus infinity. Okay, I'm not going to read all that. It's too much stuff. You can look under Gaussian function. Okay. And let's just double check this here. Okay, so we're going to put these equations together to give the general equation of the heat flow. It shows the heat flow. And then it shows this solving the heat equation using Fourier series. And... Okay, so I'm going to scoot over to here before I go into that. Here's my notes here. Um, January 21st, 2012, 9.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Google searches up to this date. My thoughts continue. I found something during my Google on fiber optics from the Bosca tests. Superluminal energy transport created by using optical fibers. They say it violates physical laws. Do the neutrinos traveling faster than the speed of light violate physical laws? Yep. Quote, Bodgud refers to brilliant optical time domain analysis, the Bodgud sensor system equipped with one electro-optic modulator has been studied for measuring distributed strain and temperature. A sensor using the backward sim stimulation brilliant scattering SBS of an optical fiber. The pumping pulse light is launched light is launched at one end of the fiber and propagates in the fiber, while the CW light is launched at the opposite end of the fiber and propagates in the opposite direction. In this configuration, the pump pulse generates backward, brilliant gain in a single mode fiber. When the CD CW light frequency is different from the pump pulse light, as same as the brilliant frequency of the optical fiber, then the CW light is amplified through brilliant interaction with the pump pulse. Also, the brilliant frequency of a fiber is changed by the strain or temperature applied on the fiber. Therefore, the brilliant frequency shift can give the temperatures or strain information as the following equation. And that's the equation there. Where E and T are strain and temperature, respectively C1 and C2 are the strain and temperature coefficients, respectively, which are known to be about 0.05 megahertz microstrain. And 1.2 megahertz di um, divided by, or Celsius, I'm not sure how to say that. For conventional single mode optical fibers used at the 1500 nm wavelength range of optical communication. Ooh, long one. www.bodka.com is where you can find that. The term superluminal energy transport was found in total internal reflection, how fiber optics work. If you wiki total internal reflection, um, you'll find it there. Remember when I said that this alien technology is going to include inventions from people all over the world? Putting the pieces together and working as one unit? Have you tried this Bodka technology with a neutrino? Bodka, brilliant optical time domain analysis. See definition on how it uses pulse, light, and fi fi optical fibers. Okay, so this is something that was created by uh, solving the heat equation using Fourier series. He made this many, many moons ago, and I don't think we've, we haven't uh, used it yet. Idealized physical setting for heat conduction in a rod with homogeneous boundary conditions. 
The following solution technique for the heat equation was proposed by Joseph Fournier in his treatise Theorie Analytique de la Chaleur, published in 1822. Let us consider the heat equation for one space variable. This could be used to model heat conduction in a rod. The equation is U T equals A U X X, where U equals U X T is a function of two variables, X and T, where X is the space variable, so X is where L is the length of the rod, T is the time variable. This is Joseph Fourier. That's the data about him. He was born March 21st, 1768, and he died May 16th, 1830. And let's pull some information here. From in 1822, Fourier presented his work on heat flow in Theorie Analytique de la Chaleur, the analytical, analytic theory of heat, in which he based his reasoning on Newton's law of cooling, namely that the flow of heat between two adjacent molecules is proportional, propor, proportional to the extremely small difference of their temperatures. So, Wicke and Joseph Fournier. Next is there were three important contributions in his work in this work, one purely mathematical, two essentially physical. In mathematics, Fournier claimed that any function of a variable, whether continuous or discontinuous, can be expanded in a series of signs of multiples of the variable. Data that stands out. This is the graph so the sine and cosine functions are sinuoids of different phases. And that's under sine wave on wiki. Excitation of the higher overtones involves progressively less and less additional energy and eventually leads to disassociation of the molecule as the potential energy of the molecule is more like a Morse potential. Okay, and there's some more stuff here. Uh, I'll do this one here. The sine wave or sinusoid is a mathematical function that describes a smooth repetitive oscillation. It occurs often in pure mathematics as well as physics, signal processing, electrical engineering, and many other fields. Its most basic form as a function of time is t is y to the t equals a dot sin wt minus zero, where a is the amplitude, is the peak deviation of the function from its center position, w the angular frequency specifies how many oscillations occur in a unit time interval in radians per second, Zero, the phase specifies where its cycle, the oscillation, begins at t equals zero. When the phase is non-zero, the entire waveform appears to be shifted in time by the amount of seconds. A negative value represents a delay and a positive value represents an advance. There's a sine wave there. The oscillation of an undamped spring mass system around the equilibrium is a sine wave. I guess that's what it looks like. The sine wave is important in physics because it retains its wave shape when added to another sine wave of the same frequency and arbitrary phase. It is the only periodic waveform that has this property. This property leads to its importance in Fourier's analysis and makes it acoustically unique. And this is what a sine wave looks. Sine x and cos x. Okay. And where, I don't know what that symbol means is the wavelength, F is the frequency, and C is the speed of propagation. This equation gives a sine wave for a single dimension. Thus the generalized equation given above gives the amplitude, there's an equation there, gives the amplitude of a wave at a position X at time T along a single line. This could for example be considered the value of a wave along a wire. In two or three spatial dimensions, the same equation describes a traveling plane wave if position x and wave number k are interpreted as vectors and their product as a dot product. For more complex waves, such as the height of water wave in a pond after a stone has been dropped in, more complex equations are needed. And there's the Fourier series, the sign. There's a sign that says square, triangle, and sawtooth. So the sign, square, triangle, and sawtooth waveforms uh, were created from, in 1822, Joseph Fournier, a French mathematician, discovered that sinusoidal waves can be used as simple building blocks to describe and approximate any periodic waveform, including square waves. 
Fourier used it as an analytical tool in the study of waves and heat flow. It is frequently used in signal processing and the statistical analysis of time series. Okay, and I'm going to go back over here before we get way off here. Uh, actually, it's spectrography. Okay, so on this side here, we've got more data to look at. Raymond spectroscopy, which typically uses visible light, can also be used to measure vibration frequencies directly. Vibrational excitation can occur in conjunction with electronic excitation vibronics transition, giving vibrational fine structure to electronic transitions, particularly with mo mo molecules in the gas state. Simultaneous excitation of, vib of a vibration and rotations gives rise to vibration rotation spectra. And, okay, so the next thing I highlighted from the data was diatomic molecules are molecules composed only of two or two atoms of either the same or different chemical elements. The prefix di means two in Greek. Common diatomic molecules are hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon monoxide. Seven elements exist in the diatomic state in the liquid and solid forms. And that's all of them there. And most elements, many chemical compounds. Aside from these form diatomic molecules when evaporated, although at very high temperatures, all materials disintegrate into atoms. The noble gases do not form diatomic molecules. That's very important because they're doing the study of neutrinos and they're trying to figure out why the it came up something about something decaying or or disintegrating. So I pulled it out because I don't know what it means, but it has something to do with that. Hundreds of diatomic molecules have been characterized in the terrestrial environment, laboratory and interstellar medium. About 99% of the Earth's atmosphere is composed of diatomic molecules, specifically oxygen and nitrogen at 21% and 78% respectively. The natural abundance of hydrogen, H2, in the Earth's atmosphere is only on the order of parts per million, but H2 is in fact the most abundant diatomic molecule seen in nature. The interstellar medium is indeed dominated by hydrogen atoms. Elements that consist of diatomic molecules under typical laboratory conditions of 1 bar and 25 degrees Celsius include hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and the halogens. <clears throat> Again, many other diatomics are possible in form when elements are evaporated, but these diatomic species repolymerize at lower temperatures. For example, heating, cracking, elemental phosphorus gives dysphosphorus. Next is energy levels. It is convenient and common to represent a diatomic molecule as two point masses, the two atoms connected by a massless spring. The energies involved in the various motions of the molecule can then be broken down into three categories. The translational energies, the rotational energies, the vibrational energies, and there's a translation of energies. And there's the mathematical equations that came up with that. Vibrational energies. Another way a diatomic molecule can move is to have each atom osculate or vibrate along a line, the bond connecting the two atoms. The vibrational energy is approximately that of a quantum harmonic oscillator. Comparison between rotational and vibrational energy spacings. So the spacing and the energy of a typical spectroscopic transition between vibrational energy levels is about 100 times greater than that of a typical transition between rotational energy levels. Now when we, we looked at spectro, spectroscopic transitions, um, that was when a planet passes in front of a sun or, or a star and it um, it flickers so that you can see that there's a, a, a disturbance. And if there's a disturbance, then they know there's some sort of planet there. So I pulled that out. <clears throat> so a molecular vibration, molecular vibration occurs when atoms in a molecule are in periodic motion, while the molecule as a whole has constant translational and rotational motion. Okay. A molecular vibration is excited when the molecule absorbs a quantum of energy. E corresponds to the vibration's energy, V according to the relation, E equals HV, where H is Planck's 
constant. A fundamental vibration is excited when one such quantum of energy is absorbed by the molecule in its ground state. When two quanta are observed, the first overtone is excited and so on to higher overtones. I thought it was interesting because we studied E earlier and Planck's constant. Those came up in earlier data. To a first approximation, the motion in a normal vibration can be described as a kind of simple harmonic motion. Okay, this is getting too much. So the vibrational states of a molecule can be probed in a variety of ways. The most direct way is through infrared spectroscopy as vibrational transitions typically require an amount of energy that corresponds to the infrared regions of the spectrum. Raymond spectro spectroscopy, which typically uses visible light, can also be used to measure vibration frequencies directly. Vibrational excitation can occur in conjunction with electronic excitation, vibronic transition giving vibrational fine structure to electronic transitions, particularly with molecules in the gas state. Simultaneous excitation of a vibration rotations gives rise to vibration rotation spectra. So the word spectra came up again, and something to do with the molecules vibrating causes spectra. So I don't know what it means, but it came up on this line 17, T2, okay? So next is line 17, T3.